previous two programs, we discussed fiscal policy, the attempt by the government to vary its expenditures and taxes to influence the overall level of economic activity. Today, we continue our focus on the government's efforts to stabilize the economy, but we turn our attention to what is called monetary policy. Most of us have borrowed money to finance some purchase like a new car or our university education. We are quite familiar with the fact that the interest rate we are charged on that loan is an important determinant of how much we can spend. Monetary policy concerns how the government tries to affect spending through interest rates. And to understand this, we must become aware of the main features of the financial system. When households save, where do the savings go? When firms invest, where do they get the funds to finance their spending? These are the kinds of questions we will address today. There are four ways in which firms can finance their investment expenditures. They can simply retain some earnings and not pay out all the profits and dividends. They can sell shares on the stock market. They can borrow money by selling a bond. Or they can take out a loan from the banks. Whichever of these four financing methods firms rely on, they acquire cash that can be used to pay for investment expenditures. To avoid repetition, we're going to focus on just one option and assume that the firms take out bank loans to finance their investment expenditures. And to understand banks and loans, we have to understand how the Bank of Canada affects the operations of chartered banks. The Bank of Canada, usually just called the bank, is the institution through which our government prints money. Suppose the bank prints more money. Since most individuals deposit the bulk of their money in a chartered bank or a trust company, most of the new currency will find its way into what we call the reserves of the chartered banks. Now, banks earn no interest on reserves, since these are just currency held in their vault. Since banks want to make profits, they try to hold no more reserves than is necessary to facilitate the withdrawals made by their customers. Banks make loans on the basis of the rest of these funds, and they earn profits when borrowers pay interest on these loans. Thus, when the Bank of Canada prints up more currency, the chartered banks get extra reserves. And this means an extra capacity to grant more loans. But the only way banks can get people to take out these loans is to have lower interest rates. And when they charge lower interest rates, it means that more people can afford to buy more large items and that firms can afford to expand their plant and equipment. So the consumption and investment components of total spending increase. Remember our aggregate demand tools? The lower borrowing costs, by stimulating spending, shift the aggregate demand curve to the right and aggregate demand increases. Thus, output is increased and jobs can be created. And at the same time, prices are increased when there's a significant increase in the nation's money supply. We've already discussed the reasoning summarized by this lower portion of this chart in earlier programs. Today, our job is to develop the understanding of this upper part of the story in this portion. What we have just sketched through is the domestic route showing what happens following an increase in the money supply. If some of the extra money is used in foreign transactions, then the avenue of effect is a little different, but the net result is the same. An increased supply of Canadian dollars in the world's currency markets causes a fall in the international value of our currency. This makes it cheaper for foreigners to buy our goods and more expensive for us to buy imports. In this case, it is the net export component of aggregate demand that increases to create jobs and put upward pressure on prices. The end result is the same. It will be helpful to keep this chart in mind as a general roadmap while we delve into the details of our financial system. Either way, an increased money supply leads to increased spending. Domestically, the effect is through changing interest rates. Internationally, it's through changing exchange rates. We now understand, in broad terms at least, how monetary policy, that is a change in the nation's money supply, works. But to understand monetary policy in more detail, we must also talk about institutions. Money was invented many years ago as a way for people to avoid what economists call the double coincidence of wants. This means there's a difficulty in finding trading partners when people simply barter one good for another. All kinds of commodities have served as money, but a commodity that can last as a useful money must be storable, easy to carry around, and it has to be hard to counterfeit. 
precious metal coins satisfied all these needs and so were widely used. But coins can still be stolen, and so enterprising individuals set up warehouses where people could deposit their gold coins and get an IOU slip that they could use to retrieve their gold whenever they wanted to make an expenditure. After a while, people realized that they could just trade the IOU slips. If I want to buy something from you, I cross out your name on the slip and have the warehouse owe you the gold instead of me. So that's when we moved to paper money, where the actual commodity that was used for money the paper currency had no real intrinsic value as a commodity compared to the face value of what is written on the piece of paper. After a while, the gold warehouse managers realized that they were hardly ever asked for this gold because the paper was just doing all the circulating. Thus, they started making loans based on their gold reserves. Whenever they made a loan, they printed up another IOU slip, so there came to be many more IOU slips than gold in the warehouses. When people realized this and feared that when they took their IOU slips in, there might not be any gold to honor the promise, the warehouse company would go bankrupt and the depositors lost their wealth. You can see where this history led. The warehouses eventually became banks and trust companies, and government regulations were designed to avoid crises of public confidence by keeping these institutions solvent. An example is deposit insurance. Even if a financial institution goes bankrupt, as long as your deposit is less than $60,000, the government will pay you back. So now there's little reason to have a run against a bank. What serves as most of our money today is not even paper currency. Since we often pay by check, it's mostly our deposits in bank accounts that represent the nation's money supply. So if we're going to learn anything about the quantity of money, we have to understand chartered banking. John Palmer now explains how banks keep their books. The easiest way to understand banks and the money supply is to refer to simple balance sheets which show the assets and liabilities of our chartered banks. An asset is anything an individual or an institution owns or controls. A liability is anything that that institution or individual owes someone else. Liabilities are claims on assets. Here's a very simplified version of a balance sheet for a chartered bank. Things that it owns include its reserves, including currency in its vault, plus its deposits at the Bank of Canada, and the loans that it makes to allow people to buy things like cars. Each loan is an asset because it represents an income stream of payments coming into the bank. A loan is a liability from the borrower's point of view, but it's an asset from the bank's point of view, and it's the banks we're considering here. And then, of course, there are other assets, like the bank building, which we're going to ignore for now since they don't really figure into our discussion of monetary policy. Over here on the liability side, the main entry is deposits. These deposits are assets for customers, but they're the bank's obligation to pay us. They're a liability for the bank. And then for any healthy business, the assets exceed the liabilities, and the difference is called the company's net worth what's left over for the owners after all the other claims against the assets are met. The most common definition of the nation's money supply is the total of everyone's deposits at the chartered banks, plus any currency circulating outside the banks. Other definitions include our deposits in trust companies, but the broad outlines of monetary policy are the same whichever definition is used. For simplicity, we'll focus just on chartered banks. To discuss monetary policy then, we must understand what happens to the total level of bank deposits when new currency is printed up. Let's consider a specific example to illustrate what economists call the money multiplier. Suppose everyone who receives money puts it all on deposit at banks and they don't hold any of it in their pocket, purse, or mattress. Also, to illustrate the basics of money creation, let's assume that banks choose to hold reserves equal to 10% of whatever their deposit obligations are. Actually, banks hold a much lower reserves to deposit ratio than 10%, since very little is needed to satisfy the withdrawal habits of the bank's customers. But we just want a simple numerical example to illustrate the principles involved. Now, suppose a new $100 bill is printed and is given to you as a part of your student loan. You will likely either deposit it in your bank, or you will use it for something, say, to pay the services of a typist for your economics essay. In this case, the typist is the one who puts $100 into his bank. So after this deposit, 
Bank number one has $100 more in reserves in its vault because the $100 bill is now there. And it also has an additional $100 obligation to the typist who made the deposit. The bank's balance sheet still balances, but it's not in a state that they're going to want to leave it in. On this last bit of deposits, the $100 worth of extra deposits they've just received, the bank is holding reserves on a one-for-one -one basis. They want to hold reserves on only a one-for-ten ratio. To earn more profits, the banks will want to grant more new loans equal to 90 out of that $100. The second step in this process, then, has the effect that the bank draws its new reserves down to just plus 10, making loans of 90 to some other customer. That borrower is going to buy something with it, say maybe flowers for a special person. And when they spend this $90, the florist will deposit it in her bank. Let's call that bank number two. Now there will be 90 more dollars in its reserves. But bank number two won't want to leave all this as reserves because reserves don't earn any interest. Using the 10% ratio once again, this bank will pull its extra reserves down to just a plus nine, and they will make extra loans equal to plus 81. And then that extra 81 will get spent, and somebody else will deposit 81 in yet another bank. You can see what's happening. It's another multiplicative process. The total quantity of bank deposits that gets created in this process is a multiple of the amount of new currency that was introduced into the system in the first place. To determine the size of this total, we add up all these rounds of extra deposits. We've got the first $100 deposit, then the $90 deposit, then the $81 deposit, etc. We can rewrite this sum as 100 times 1 plus 0 0.9, plus 0 0.9 squared, etc., and so on. As you will recognize, this sum is similar to the multiplier formula we developed in earlier programs. It's equal to 100 times 1 over 1 minus 0.9, or 100 times 1 over 0.1, which is just 100 times 10, or $1,000. Thus, in this numerical example, because the reserve to deposit ratio of the banks is one-tenth, the money multiplier is the inverse of that, or 10. These calculations involve both an upward and a downward bias. For one thing, people do not hold all their money as deposits. They hold some as currency. To that extent, the banks don't get to lend as much as they did in our example, so for this reason, the actual money multiplier in the real world is less than 10. But more important is the fact that modern banks can satisfy the day-to-day -day needs with, of their depositors with a reserve to deposit ratio much lower than 10%. Thus, the nation's money supply is a very large multiple of the quantity of currency that the government prints up. It is therefore important that the government not print up an inappropriate quantity of currency. The last step in understanding the mechanics of money and banking is to appreciate how the initial $100 of new currency actually gets introduced in the first place. To proceed with this final step, we must learn about a country's central bank. Our central bank, the Bank of Canada, came into existence with the passage of an Act of Parliament in 1935. This Act makes sure that chartered banks don't take part in such risky ventures that people lose confidence in the stability of the financial system. The Bank of Canada was established as a lender of last resort. It can lend reserves to any chartered bank that is running short in any period to provide stability to the financial system. The governor of the Bank of Canada is appointed for seven years and, while he is somewhat independent, he is expected to work very closely with the Federal Minister of Finance. Central bankers see one of their fundamental goals as preserving the purchasing power of money, and that means keeping inflation under control. Since inflation results from too much money chasing too few goods, central bankers often serve as an independent check on a government's temptation to print a lot of new currency to finance expenditures that exceed its tax revenues. John Palmer now explains central bank operations. We'll get a better understanding of the Bank of Canada if we focus on its balance sheet, which we see here in a simplified form. The main items which the bank owns or controls are gold, our country's holdings of foreign currencies, and government bonds. 
Gold used to be the international medium of exchange, and that's why this item appears in the list of items that the Bank of Canada has purchased over the years. On the liabilities side of the bank's balance sheet, the major item is the total amount of currency that has been issued. It's an odd liability, though. It's an IOU slip from an accounting perspective, but of course you can't get anything if you present, say, a $10 bill to the Bank of Canada other than a different $10 bill in exchange. The other liabilities are the deposit obligations of the Bank of Canada. You and I are not allowed to hold deposit accounts at the Bank of Canada. The main institutions that do are the chartered banks and the Government of Canada. We are now in a position to see the primary way in which the Bank of Canada changes the overall reserves of the chartered banking system. At the intuitive level, it's very simple. To increase the supply of currency, all the central bank has to do is buy something, it could be anything, and pay for it with the new currency. Since the Bank of Canada often does this through the purchase of government bonds on the open market, we follow through the recording of such a transaction here in the balance sheets. Here are the, are the balance sheets of the Bank of Canada and the chartered banks side by side. Numbered arrows like these indicate an open market operation. When the Bank of Canada buys some government bonds that used to be held by a member of the public, we have an increase here showing that the central bank has acquired more bonds. The bank pays for its bonds by writing a check against itself to the member of the public who sold the bonds. So at whichever chartered bank that the individual does her banking at, she deposits her check and that's why we see this upward arrow number two. That's the depositing of the check that she got for selling the bonds to the Bank of Canada. The check then has to be cleared through the banking system. The chartered bank sends the check back to the institution that it was written against, the Bank of Canada, saying please credit our account with you for having honored this check on your behalf. So that's arrows three and four. The chartered bank's deposit at the Bank of Canada goes up by the same amount. That entry occurs as both a liability of the central bank, arrow three, and an asset for the chartered bank, arrow four. So these four arrows completely describe a purchase of bonds by the central bank on the open market. Now, as we look at the chartered bank's balance sheet, we see that they're just at the initial stage of the multiple expansion of deposits that we described just a few minutes ago. The reserves of the chartered banks can be held either as cash or as funds on deposit at the central bank. So in this example, the chartered bank reserves have gone up dollar for dollar with their deposit obligations. But they want to hold only a very small fraction of this amount as additional reserves. We've already seen how loans and further deposits get created when the banks are in an excess reserve situation like this. In this instance, the multiple expansion of deposits has been triggered by a decision at the Bank of Canada to buy government bonds on the open market. Another point is worth emphasizing. I could move this arrow from government bonds to foreign exchange, and the other three arrows would stay exactly the same. In other words, so far as the reserves of chartered banks are concerned, it doesn't really matter what the central bank buys from the public. Purchasing foreign exchange does the very same thing to the nation's money supply as purchasing government bonds. And we refer to either of these activities as an expansionary monetary policy. The Bank of Canada often buys or sells foreign exchange with a view to affecting the international value of the Canadian dollar, that is, our exchange rate. Whenever the exchange rate goes up or down by any great amount, a number of commentators can be expected to call for a policy limiting exchange rate fluctuations. What the balance sheet analysis has made clear is that an exchange rate policy of this sort and monetary policy are the same thing. Our central bank can try to control the international value of our currency by standing ready to buy and sell large quantities of foreign exchange. For example, to keep the value of the Canadian dollar from rising, the Bank of Canada must make more Canadian dollars available by buying foreign exchange. But if the bank does that, it has performed an expansionary monetary policy. The effect of trying to control the exchange rate, then, is that Canadian monetary policy is dictated by whatever develops in the foreign markets. The central bank gives up its freedom to have an independent monetary policy if it fixes the value of our exchange rate. In addition to conducting open market transactions now, involving the bonds and foreign exchange, the Bank of Canada is also involved in deposit switching. 
on a day-to-day -day basis, there's all kinds of shuffling around of deposits from one chartered bank to another as people and firms settle their accounts. This shuffling causes short-run variations in the overall quantity of reserves and can lead to some temporary instability in the financial markets. But the Bank of Canada can iron out these fluctuations. All it has to do is write a check from the government to the government. Now, that probably seems like a pretty stupid thing to do, but by consulting the balance sheets, we can see how this process of deposit switching will change the nation's money supply. Suppose the Bank of Canada writes a check against the Government of Canada's deposits that are held at the central bank and draws down that account there. It then makes the check payable to another one of the Government of Canada's accounts over at one of the chartered banks. So this account of the government at a chartered bank goes up by the same amount that the one over at the Bank of Canada goes down. The government doesn't gain or lose, but look what happens when the check clearing process is completed. The chartered bank sends the check back to the Bank of Canada and they get compensated by having their deposit account at the central bank, that is their reserves, credited by that same amount. So both the central bank and the chartered bank balance sheet still balance. But once again, the chartered bank reserves and the chartered bank deposit liabilities have gone up one for one. And because of our fractional reserve system, banks don't need or want reserves to go up anything like that much. By this simple shuffling of government funds, the Bank of Canada has arranged it so that the private banks are in a position once again to set off a multiple expansion of loans and deposits. The day-to-day -day operations of monetary policy are deposit switching and open market operations in either the bond or foreign exchange markets. But these sorts of transactions are fairly hard for people to understand and not prominently reported on a regular basis. What we need is a single indicator we can follow to see whether the central bank is trying to be contractionary or expansionary in all of these detailed operations. In their quest for such an indicator, analysts have settled on the bank rate. Every Tuesday afternoon, a number of short-term government bonds called treasury bills are auctioned off. Whatever rate of interest that auction brings is called the treasury bill yield for that week. The bank rate is that interest rate which the Bank of Canada charges the chartered banks for any loans the chartered banks ever need to take out to replenish their reserves on a short-term basis. That bank rate is always set by law at one quarter of one percent above the weekly treasury bill auction yield. The chartered banks virtually never have to borrow any reserves, so the bank rate is a loan rate that almost never matters in that direct sense but it is still watched by many firms and individuals as an indicator of what the central bank has been doing. For instance, if the central bank has been either deposit switching toward chartered banks or making open market purchases of bonds and foreign exchange, then they have been raising the reserves of the chartered banking system. The only way the chartered banks will be able to make all those new loans is to lower interest rates. So lower interest rates go with increases in the money supply in the short run. Thus, a lower bank rate often means that the central bank has been expanding the money supply that week, and a higher bank rate means that the Bank of Canada has been contracting the money supply. One important caution concerning the bank rate should be mentioned at this point. Remember that in our first program on macroeconomics, we distinguished the real interest rate from the nominal interest rate. The nominal interest rate is the sum of the real yield savers receive plus the underlying expected rate of inflation. Over the longer run time intervals, large money supply increases cause a lot of inflationary expectations. Thus, even though money supply increases may cause real yields to fall in the short run, they raise the underlying inflation rate in the long run and so raise nominal interest rates in the longer term time horizon. In the short run, when people's underlying inflationary expectations are given, there is no problem in associating bank rate decreases with money supply increases, and vice versa. Just look at how the bank rate has been changing recently, not at the overall level of the bank rate, to assess the direction of current monetary policy. Here is a review of the key concepts covered in this program. We learned how our system of fractional reserve banking evolved. 
The total quantity of the public's deposits at chartered banks is a major component of the country's money supply, and that total is equal to the money multiplier times the quantity of bank reserves. In a simplified setting, the money multiplier is the inverse of the chartered bank's reserve to deposit ratio. Chartered bank reserves can be increased by open market purchases of bonds or foreign exchange and by switching government deposits into chartered banks. Expansionary monetary policies of this sort put downward pressure on interest rates in the short run, which we can monitor by observing the weekly changes in the bank rate. In today's program, we have assumed the Bank of Canada knows what the appropriate value of the money supply is, and we have focused on how the central bank regulates the reserves available to the private banking system. In our next program, we will determine what the appropriate level for the money supply is. That is, we will switch our attention from the mechanics of monetary policy to the purpose of monetary policy.